Welcome to Towers of Faith for this second in our series of theological lectures. We're very privileged tonight to welcome Father Matthew Dorman to speak to us all the way from the other side of the Atlantic on his uh, specialist subject, Father Martin Thornton. Father Thornton was um, a farmer, an Anglican priest and a theologian. Born in 1915, he was spurred by a mystical beech tree experience, as he calls it, as a farmer. And in so experiencing, he pursued holy orders and received degrees from King's College London under Eric Symes Abbott and later Christ College Cambridge under Ian Ramsey. He was twice visiting lecturer at the General Theological Seminary in New York, where he received an honorary doctorate in 1966. And from 1975 until his death, he was Canon Chancellor of Truro Cathedral. The bishop at the time was Bishop Graham Leonard, who called Father Thornton the most natural and supernatural canon uh, Christian I have known. He wrote 13 books that focused on pastoral and ascetical theology and always wrote them in a, a mode of ressourcement which was attuned to prayer book pastoral sensibility with wide ranging topics that included scriptural exegesis, liturgical life, and especially the importance of the daily office, parochial theology, a topic which he himself coined, personal devotion and prayer, spiritual direction in both its art and its science, asceticism, as well as pastoral studies on specific voices within what he calls the English school of Catholic theology, Catholic spirituality, from Anselm to the Caroline Divines and on through Macquarie, with the most attention given to Marjorie Kemp. His book, The Purple-Headed Mountain, was the Archbishop of Canterbury's Lent book for 1963. Father Dorman, our speaker tonight, is a parish priest for the parish of Caswell County in the Episcopal Diocese of Springfield, Illinois. He's an oblate to St. John's Abbey, Collegeville, Minnesota, and he is the leading authority on the theology of Father Martin Thornton, whose works he has exclusive permission to reissue. He has an MTS from the Shota House with thesis on the theology of Martin Thornton, which included meetings with Thornton's wife, Monica, his daughter, Magdalene, along with Benedict Ward, Rowan Williams, Alison Milbank, and George Westhaver. He has an MA in liturgical ministry from the Catholic Theological Union and a baccalaureate from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri in English literature and creative writing. For 10 years, he has had an, an active social media presence uh, to promote Thornton's insights on prayer, parish life and ascetical spirituality, which led him seven years ago to found Akenside Institute for English Spirituality and its publishing arm, Akenside Press. Its purpose is to develop resources that aid the rediscovery of orthodox Catholic reality in prayer book parish life. He lives in Pekin, Illinois, near Peoria, with his wife, five children, seven chickens, two cats, and a dog. And as if there were no end to his talents, he also bakes traditional sourdough bread with which he feeds the natives. I hope that was a sufficient introduction to our speaker and to his topic tonight. So I leave you now to enjoy Father Martin Thornton, a talk given by Father Matthew Dorman. Father Chris mentioned a little bit of my background. I just wanted to add that in the Diocese of Springfield, which is most of the, the two thirds of the southern half of the state of Illinois, our, our bishop, and along with several priests, uh, study Martin Thornton and apply his insights that's largely because of, at Neshota House, where many of our clergy uh, receive their training, Martin Thornton has been on the, the ascetical curriculum for several decades. In fact, he, Martin Thornton, a, a small detail, was very close to being uh, a, a faculty member at Neshota House in the early 70s. Instead, he was called by Graham Leonard to be the canon chancellor of Truro Cathedral, but we'll get into that a little bit later. I've been studying Father Thornton for nine years, got deep in very quickly as a layman. My, my priest uh, immediately called me a Thornton junkie. And um, 
in addition to what Father Chris said about my master's thesis uh, and the people I met in the UK, um, I also the meeting with Rowan Williams was very uh, enlightening for me because he said very clearly that Martin Thornton's theology is largely overlooked. And in that group, he also included Eric Maskell. Um, but then he hastened to add, for no good reason. And that was very important and inspiring for me to make sure that, um, that uh, the, the lack of co consideration widely of Father Thornton's theology would soon change. I also spent two weeks at Gladstone's library while I was there, which used to be called St. Daniel's. That is where I met with Monica Thornton. And that is where Martin Thornton spent six years of his life writing about the first half of his corpus. Um, so it was hallowed ground for me. I was, I was on a bit of a pilgrimage, I suppose. Um, so I'm here to talk about Mar Martin Thornton. And um, in discussions with Father Sam ahead of of, of this presentation, it became clear to me that although, like many people, I would just jump right into the theology, um, it seems that this might be the first exposure to Martin Thornton for many people here gathered, also might be the um, first very in-depth exposure for others. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time about Martin Thornton's life and the context in which he found himself. Um, the image that I would like to uh, use for this presentation would be something like a drone, which has the ability to go very high in the air and see large vistas of land and move very quickly, um, which we will do. And then also has the ability, of course, to go all the way down uh, to the ground and witness very small things moving slowly, which will be our look at, at Father Thornton's text. And I want to, the, the context uh, is important to set so that um, I can, so that Father Thornton's words can speak, which I intend to allow them to do. Um, I will offer comments as we look at various passages of his, but he's such an engaging writer, and I hope that going through his life a bit and his context that his, uh, that, that will come through. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen right now so that the presentation that I put together comes up. So just hold on a moment. Okay. Is it, uh, is it up? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this, I've entitled my presentation, Par Parish Prayer Life, The Parochial Theology of Martin Thornton. And that is a term that he coined himself, parochial theology. And I hope certainly by the end of this that there is a sense of what he means by that. Um, I've already given my introductory remarks. Uh, we'll move now uh, into the basics of Father Thornton's life and context. Part three will be his Beech Tree Mystical Experience, um, which is central, I think, to everything about his parochial theology and all the rest. Then we'll look at his parochial theology in four dimensions or four aspects of it. And then I'll offer some concluding remarks and assuming that I don't lollygag and go on too many tangents between now and the end, we will hopefully end with a delightful little poem he wrote, the only one, called Ode to Millicent. There will be a question and answer period follows, as Christopher, Father Christopher said. All right, it's, it can be helpful, I think, to know a little bit about what other people have said about Father Thornton. And Many, if not all of you, are familiar with Graham Leonard, the sometime Bishop of Truro, and then later Bishop of London, later ordained Ro Roman Catholic priest and appointed Monsignor. He wrote in the foreword to Father Thornton's final book, A Joyful Heart, which was uh, released posthumously, these words, Martin was both the most natural and the most supernatural Christian I have known. Natural and that he was intensely human and used the stuff of ordinary life to express profound and theological truths. Supernatural, in that God was supreme reality to him. Everything he did and said was shot through with an awareness of God. The two of them wet, met while they were students at Cambridge um, before heading out into parish life, as it were. 
to they were long friends. John McCory also knew Father Thornton for over three decades. And in a personal correspondence after his death, Father, uh, Father McCory being decorated theologian and Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity at Oxford for 16 years, wrote in a personal correspondence after the death of Father Thornton, I remember him as a quiet, deeply spiritual man who was trying to make prayer and the spiritual life meaningful in a secular world. And in his capitalization, his books can still teach us. Um, undoubtedly, everyone's familiar with just with the image of, of this next example. And he, of course, is also the winner of Father Sam's contest recently, and I, and I say justly so. In the foreword that Arthur Michael Ramsey wrote to Martin Thornton's The Purple-Headed Mountain, which was the Archbishop's Lent book of 1963, he wrote, this is a book at once practical and profound about the calling of a Christian. That calling is likened to the climbing of a mountain, purple-headed because the way of ascent is the way of penitence, and penitence is that right view of one state before God, which enables true vision instead of a vision clouded with unrealities. It is therefore a book which points the reader uncompromisingly towards the heights, but at every point there is a down-to-earth practicality about its treatment of the spiritual life. Interestingly, uh, less directly, Thomas Merton opined upon Martin Thornton, and this is captured in Merton, a biography by Monica Furlong, which is probably familiar to the Merton fans out there. And it comes from a letter that Merton wrote to Donald Alchin. The two of them were friends. So most of this passage is Furlong, and then what's quoted is Merton. He, was taking, he, Merton, was taking a close interest in Anglicanism, an enthusiasm fed by his friendship with Donald Alchin of Pusey House in Oxford. With the advice from Father Alchin, he was reading a good deal of Anglican history, as well as some 17th century Anglican divines. And modern Anglican writers, such as Thornton and Strangs, that's C.J. Strangs. It seems to me, Merton said, that the best of Anglicanism is unexcelled. And here he's talking about Thornton and others, but that there are few who have the refinement of spirit to see and embrace the best, and so many who fall into the dreariest rationalism. So Thornton there in the letter, which I have, is referred to in the, the few who, who do have the refinement of spirit. For my part, I will try to cling to the best and be as English a Catholic as one in my position can be. I do think it's terribly important for Roman Catholics now plunging into vernacular to have some sense of the Anglican tradition to which many of us will say, huzzah. And, and the last voice, of course, might be uh, the most important, and that's his wife, Monica. And here is their wedding um, in 1968 in Dorset at St. Mary Magdalene in Loders. And from the recollections of his life that Monica gave me, these handwritten uh, vita of her late husband, she wrote, for Martin, the Christian faith did not consist in a wide Christendom type of life in the world, but an ascetical demanding relationship with God, constantly examined through the confessional, a ladder of ascent in the style of the Desert Fathers, but with the ultimate goal of transfiguring this world in the recapitulation tradition of Irenaeus and Fortunatus. It never worried him that only a few people came to church. He was not interested in pew filling, but rather in filling out the spiritual capacity of each Christian soul who did come and developing their interior life of prayer. She also wrote, Martin was convinced that sound prayer sprang from right belief and that a thorough grasp of Christian doctrine was necessary if we are to pray aright. Thus the doctrine of the Holy Trinity was the foundation of his prayer we pray to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Erroneous ways of viewing the person of Christ and his relation to the Father affected our own way of praying and living. He always taught. For him, right belief, as for an Eastern Orthodox, was essential for right living and right praying. 
here is his gravestone, which is in Krukern, 1915 to 1986, farmer, priest, author, the word of God, his rule, the glory of God, his aim, and to God, the Holy Trinity was all his guiding. Martin Stewart Farron Thornton died on Trinity Sunday, which was the 22nd of June, 1986, and was buried in Townsend Cemetery in Kruger in Somerset, as I said. He had written 13 books, 12 widely read in the UK and the US. Only 466 copies of his first book were published. I have one of them. If you are one of those that have another, uh, connect because we're a very select group. He was canon chancellor, theologian, parish priest, spiritual director, catechist, retreat leader, retreat leader, and visiting lecturer in the U.S. Prior to the priesthood, an organic farmer during World War II on lands in Finchingfield, a village in the Braintree District in Northwest Essex. Positions that he held in reverse order and, and including some honors along the way, canon chancellor Truro, as I mentioned, um, uh, of the cathedral in Truro since 1975, mostly under Graham Leonard, which was very happy, and then for him, unhappily under Peter Mumford, and that's not a judgment upon anybody, simply how Martin described it. Before that, he officiated in Lyme Bay Deanery for three years, Diocese of Salisbury. 1970, he was a visiting lecturer at Philadelphia Divinity School in the US. He was always very, very excited to head to the United States to teach. Three years, he was Vicar of St. Mary the Virgin in Payenbury, Diocese of Exeter. Before that, or I guess, yeah, right before that, he received the Doctorate of Sacred Theology from the General Theological Seminary with the words, his new understanding of the relationship between priest and people has created a revolution in thinking about the subject of pastoral care. And I do not think for a moment but that is overstatement, although I can understand if some of you along here think that it might be. But I truly think that it is uh, very accurate. He was visiting lecture at ascetics in general. That was his first stint. So he had two stints at General Theological Seminary. And this was back when the likes of John McCory and Alexander Schmemann were uh, adjuncts faculty at General, uh, to give you a sense of the quality of the faculty there during that time. In 62 through 68, he was a warden and teacher at St. Daniel's Library, uh, Harden, Wales, now called Gladstone's Library. Um, and there's that first visit, I'm sorry, it was in 1960 to General as a visiting, visiting lecturer. 59, he started as a reader at St. Daniel's. In 58 to 62, he was assistant curate at St. Michael's Coppenhall Crew in the Diocese of Chester. 55, he, re, he was awarded the MA from Cambridge. He was taught primarily by Ian Ramsey, who was very influential upon Thornton's outlook, theological outlook. 55 also saw his profession of full vows to the Oratory of Good Shepherd which um, were periodic vows, and they ended naturally in 1968 when he married Monica. 57 to 52, he was vicar of Swaffham Prior in Cambridgeshire, Diocese of Ely. Um, King's College for his BA, there he was taught by Eric Sines Abbott, Hubert Relton, and Edward C. Radliff, Radcliffe, both very, or all, all very large names in the C of E at that time. A curate in St. George's Chacheson, Diocese of Ely for three years. Rural Synthesis, his very first book was published in 1948, a year after he was ordained priest by the Bishop of Norwich. And a year after, pr prior to that, he was ordained deacon and made curate of St. Nicholas Gaten, Diocese of Norwich. His early 1940s, while he was a farmer, had his beech tree experience, which we'll go into in just a moment, on lands owned by his father uh, that he farmed, uh, the, that M Martin farmed, not his father, his father owned A.A. A. Thornton and Company, a patent office in London for many decades. I'm not sure if it's still in business, but it was, in, it was, I think, until fairly recently. Those lands were an old Cistercian Grange owned by his father, which excited Martin's uh, imagination. It was in the early 1940s, perhaps the late 1930s, that Martin met and got to know Father Andrew the site of the Society of Divine uh, Compassion who often visited his parents' house, which is a, I think that means, or it's very likely that uh, for those of you who know Father Andrew's books, he had over 30 books published um, in, 
in the C of E and in, and in the United States, very, very popular devotional writer, priest, Franciscan, and spiritual director, um, and artist, and poet, and so many things. I think it's that mix that really rubbed off on Martin Thornton, or at least gave him an, an early vision of, of being a priest, because although Thornton wasn't quite an artist, he certainly was a priest, a writer, a spiritual director, and, well, as you'll see at the end, a sometime poet. A farmer during World War II, sugar beets, hogs, sheep, organic methods. He was an early adopter of organic methods, awarded the diploma of, uh, from the East Anglican Institute of Agriculture, and he was born to, to, to reach the end of this on Martinmas in Hockley, Essex, which is where his family's house always was. Uh, moving quickly, these are the, uh, the, the images of, of his 13 books. And if you, I don't know if my mouse shows up here, but this is the one I, I've designed and the one I've released. I'm slowly releasing all of them. I'll explain why, uh, well, I could say a bit why now. I, I rushed Purple Headed Mountain out, and, but then I realized that I, I should probably spend some time as a parish priest so I could really understand Martin Thornton's theology from, from, from that side of things. And so I paused to test out as a parish priest Martin Thornton's insights, which is what I've been doing for the four years I've been uh, here. So just briefly through all 13 books, Rural Synthesis, I mentioned already, 1948, A Sacramental and Christological Meditation on the Relationship Between God, Creation, which he calls the land, and Rural Man. He engages Rudolf Otto uh, and his Theology of the Numinist and Mysterium Tremendum, the Theology of the Faithful Remnant in Isaiah and Other Prophets, and the Christological heresies as applied both towards the Eucharist and to the natural world. This is while he was at King's College London and he, and he wrote this and he impressed his faculty with it. Second book took both the UK and the US by storm, Pastoral Theology, A Reorientation, SPCK 1956. It's a work for parish priests and catechists that argues for a pastoral method anchored in the development of the parochial remnant which I'll explain, as well as its related comment, the faithful remnant, introduced our hypotheses of the English School of Spirituality and the Threefold Regular. I will not be talking much about the English School of Spirituality, which could be about five more of these talks, but I am going to be talking about the Threefold Regular today. He engages uh, St. Francis de Salle, the Carmelites, Ignatius of Loyola, Eric Maskell, Kenneth Kirk, the movement from monasticism to parochialism, and the doctrine of the Trinity in, in very interesting ways. Christian Proficiency is one of the books that many people have read, especially over here in the United States, SPCK 1959, a comprehensive exposition of practices and habits of asceticism and prayer life with written for the faithful remnant, that is to say, uh, those who in parishes are taking and desire to take their spiritual life very seriously. And the book delineates comprehensively the characteristics and demands of obedient life under rule or regula, including the sacramental confession. He continues his engagement with Eric Maskell, along with uh, F.P. Harton, Scaramelli, Guibert, Bede Frost, Evelyn Underhill, and many, many more. Next was Feed My Lambs, Essays in Pastoral Reconstruction, SBCK 1960. This is a collection of essays, including on the topic of pastoral theology, the Anglican expression of the priesthood, the Oxford movement. It's his, it's his most extended uh, analysis of the Oxford movement. Along with the ascetical and systematic nature of the Book of Common Prayer, uh, meditation on scripture or Lectio Divina and more. He engages St. Benedict, continues Eric, with Eric Maskell and also with the doctrine of the faithful remnant. Then came, which might seem interesting to many of you or odd, a uh, Marjorie Kemp, an example in the English pastoral tradition, SBCK 1960. This, uh, along with another book, came out of his research for English spirituality, which I will talk about in just a moment. Here was a unique, and I want to underline and, and put in italicized and different font, that word unique commentary, because it's totally unlike any commentary I've seen, on Kemp's book, wherein he sees her as a first-class parishioner, a poor mystic, he says, or not a great mystic, but a first-class parishioner who teaches ascetical practices, attitudes of penance and joy in Christ, and teaches about sin 
and modes of prayer, which he argues are, all of which he argues are badly needed in Angle, Anglican parochial life, i.e. what I've called parishionership. He engages, interestingly enough, the Victorines, Hugh of St. Victor and others, St. Bridget of Sweden, outlines the English school some more, uh, provides a skeleton, a ascetical commentary, chapter by chapter of the book. Marjorie's book was Martin's single favorite book to read himself for uh, enrichment and um, and actually, this commentary that he wrote upon it is, is his own favorite work of his own. The second book that came out of his research for the magnum opus, of English Spirituality, was the first book that I have released uh, under Akenside Press, The Purple-Headed Mountain. I've already read to you a portion of Father of uh, Archbishop Michael Ramsey's foreword. It was Faith Press, 1962, reissued by Akenside Press. Hey, that's me, 2014. It's a catechetical meditation for all Christians about how the doctrine of creation shapes discipleship. Prayer, obedience, self-examination, sin, temptation, spiritual growth, scriptural meditation, and more topics are looked at. And it engages William of St. Thierry, Thomas Aquinas, Hugh of St. Victor, and uh, St. Francis of Assisi. So beautiful book. And then, so both of those two came out of his research for this, English spirituality, an outline of ascetical theology according to the English pastoral tradition. Brief time out, um, you know, I don't know how many of you would recognize this reference, but uh, the television show uh, Batman starring Adam West as Batman called SBCK and they want their motion graphics back. Bam, boom, bomb. Anyway, SPK, SPCK had something in mind with this, co with this cover. It was, that was 1963, and Cowley reissued it. That's an American publisher, 1986, for which Thornton wrote a second preface. It's a survey, and it, we're about to see just kind of a, what kind of a survey it is, of the English spiritual tradition rooted in ressourcement. Now, that's not a word that Thornton used in his book, but it is what he was doing according to the characteristics of what he uh, describes and delineates is the English school of Orthodox Catholic spirituality, one of up to two dozen different schools, um, all to help parish priests and catechists be, quote, reasonably competent spiritual guide. He engages the entire Western Catholic tradition from the point of view of spiritual direction. That's what the book is written for. It's not some people, as some people mistakenly think, a book of historical theology. No, it's a book to help equip parish priests and catechists become competent spiritual directors. Now, this is, might give you all a headache, so um, don't look too closely. But just to give you a sense of the voices that are covered, Augustine, Benedict, the Cistercians, the Cistercian Fathers, and, uh, with special focus on both Bernard and William of St. Thierry, the School of St. Victor, the Franciscans, Thomas Aquinas, and then the Celtic Church, which from which he only really focuses on the Celtic penitential system. St. Anselm, Walter Hilton, Julian of Norwich, Richard Raleigh, and Marjorie Kemp. A long study on the Caroline Divines, as well as the prayer book itself. And then uh, finally, the, uh, those who are after the Carolines, and then uh, final chapters on the situation today. So it's it's a lot, it's, and it's a book that I've probably read 30 times, and I don't see it, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. Following on that is a far less ambitious book called The Rock and the River, An Encounter Between Traditional Spirituality and Modern Thought, Hodder and Stoughton, 1965, a meditation that grapples with, with an interesting group of people, Bultmann, Bonhoeffer, Tillich, Brunner, uh, Protestant theology, both for its weaknesses and also the challenges it poses to Orthodox ascetic. He also revisits his theology of the, of the threefold regula and faithful remnant, and furthermore engages with John Knox, Louis Bouillet, Hans Kung, and Karl Rahner. The Function of Theology was Seabury Press, 1968, an elucidation for theologians of the nature of theological thinking, including its telos and various functions according to its to pastoral need. It's a bit of a nerdy book. So as to show links between theology and Christian practice. It's sort of the nuts and bolts of, of, of ascetical theology. He grapples with Irenaeus, Anselm, Julian of Norwich, Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Cranmer, Balthasar, one of the, a very early adopter 
uh, or a, a very early reader of, of Hans von Urs Balthasar. Ian Ramsey, Eric Maskell, and for the first time, John McCory. Following on that, Prayer, A New Encounter, Hodder and Stott in 1972, a meditation for priests and catechists on the ascetical implications of John McCory's principles of Christian theology. If the first half of Thornton's uh, writing really is centered, you, you, you might say, on Eric Maskell, the last half is centered on John McCory, and they were all, all of them were friends. It focuses on mystagogy, although that's not a term that Thornton uses in the book, but that's, that's a more modern term and also a more ancient term that uh, perfectly fits. Trinitarian discernment, contemplation, silent being, the theology of being, as well as the catechumenate. He engages with St. Benedict, Ignatius of Loyola, Heidegger, Balthasar, and many more. My God, which we'll look at in just a minute in depth, a reappraisal of normal religious experience, Hodder and Stoughton, 1974, that's the year of my birth, which is humbling. A meditation that describes the ascetical life in terms of the everyday experience of serious Christian men and women, which is one of his main themes. How to work on the everyday experience of, of normal Christian men and women. Contrasting two arenas of divine disclosure, the schools, he calls, and the wilderness, he focuses on the latter, the wilderness, and includes his description of his own numinous mystical experience at the beech tree, engaging with Ian Ramsey, William Barclay, John McCory, and his a whole bit on what he calls habitual recollection. His last major book, um, although he has one published after this, Spiritual Direction, SBCK 1984, a comprehensive overview of spiritual directors, both lay and ordained as a syllabus of studies required for competent theological and yet contemporary spiritual direction. He builds on uh, his ascetical syllabus on scripture, creed and doctrine, moral theology, spiritual theology, and the schools of spirituality, both East and West, anchored also in the art and science of diagnosing spiritual a trait or temperament of the person being directed. Lastly, uh, A Joyful Heart, his Lenten Meditations, SBCK 1987, the forward for which was uh, Graham Leonard, as I mentioned. It's a meditation that summarizes his entire corpus Several of the chapters are based upon homilies he gave at Truro Cathedral. He engages G.K. Chesterton, who was always one of his favorite writers, Thomas Aquinas, Eric Maskell again, and C.S. Lewis. And I don't even know what to say about this cover, but good God. Okay, so what then, before we end this introduction, would be the primary theological themes to think about and to take away well, at the very top, you say, if I, is a Thornton quote, which would be his primary one. If I stand for anything, it is the absolute priority of prayer. Fleshing that out, you'd start with by talking about um, his primary theme would be resourcement that delineates specific pastoral characteristics of the English school of Orthodox Catholic spirituality, both for its strengths and weaknesses. And that's talked about at length in English spirituality. What he defines as ascetic that delineates the dynamic models of total corporate spirituality and growth in the Holy Spirit. A corporate model, not talking about how uh, ascetic is sometimes used to describe specific saints, particularly Eastern saints. He doesn't mean that at all. This would be more like, like a spiritual pastoral coaching method, something like that, uh, for parish priests. Ascetical theology or the theology of ascetic as a synthetic uh, effective speculative lens, that is to say balanced in terms of feeling and thinking, upon the whole of theological endeavor. He always writes and thinks ascetically, that is to say with a, a balanced lens of, of between prayer and doctrine upon all of theology, which you might summarize as apply, his, his mode is applied doctrine. Another major theme is the parish as a redemptive organism of remnant prayer, and we'll go into this in just a bit both parochial remnant and faithful remnant. Those are complementary aspects of his theology of the remnant, remnant. And the point is for him is that the parish is a redemptive organism. The spiritual life of ordinary yet committed lay Christians is usually neglected in favor of other parish initiatives and emphases. That's a big one for him. It started out at the very beginning of his first book that the ordinary spiritual life of lay Christians who are committed and want to grow in the spirit are, are often neglected in our parishes. 
Another primary theological theme is the threefold regula or rule, office, mass, and personal devotion as the Trinitarian core of Christian ascetic and the systematic principle behind the Book of Common Prayer. We'll go into this at length in just a bit. The ascetical pastoral nature of Orthodox Catholic Anglican life demands competent spiritual direction, one of his primary themes. Uh, Anglicanism demands competent spiritual direction in areas that include mystagogy, the practices of parishionership or ascetical practices, the sermon of spirits in everyday normal experience. And Father Thornton thinks that the Anglican tradition and included back into the wider English tradition, we have a bounty of riches at our disposal for becoming competent spiritual directors, we being parish priests as well as lay catechists. It's all within our tradition and that it's a great tragedy, or at least it was at the time of his writing, that we are not embracing our own tradition that'll help us guide our parishioners into deeper relationship with Christ. Okay, so where did this all come from? Where did Martin Thornton's you know, whole way of, of presenting theology come from? I do think it came from Father Andrew quite a bit, at least um, as a vision. Whether he was actually mentored by Father Andrew, I do not know. But it came from primarily, I think, what I call the beech tree experience. So here is where the drone is going to be going from way up high, looking at the vistas, all the way down to the ground. So I hope that you'll be able to hear Thornton's voice in this. I'm not going to be offering a lot of commentary on his passages, because I really do think they speak for themselves, which is one of the strengths of his writing. So from chapter seven of his book, My God, this, a lot of these are going to be long passages. So, you know, just so you know. I was worried prior to one of the traumatic turning points in my life. I wanted to avoid something and practical reason came down firmly on the side that there was nothing to avoid. This is while he was a farmer. The odds were in my favor. I was worrying about nothing. I went for a walk, a purposeful prayer walk on his farmland because anxiety precluded more formal dialogue prayer. This was not a weakening, a giving up, but an intelligent ascetical decision. It was mid-November, dark, dank, negative, and I walked through a swamp and across two meadows. There was no question of dialogue, for there was nothing for me to say. It was more a question of a struggling yield, a giving up, half anxiety, half faith, or these proportions were possibly too optimistic. But all that was, but all that was acceptable and accepted. You dare not enter the wilderness without a theology. Then the fog descended, and so did the spirit. All shrouding is better than all enveloping, because the former word hints at death, while the latter has the false, in this case, connotation of comforting protection. If you want to make shallow jests about omnip omnipresence and holy fog, then go ahead. I shall not be amused, neither shall I be abashed. The presence of God was disclosed through the total foggy environment, and the disclosure pointed to the Father transcendent, to a providence who brooked no opposition and no argument. It was very frightening, very uncomfortable, and very real. It was also very confusing. No dialogue, no prophetic pointer, no answer. Then the fog cleared off almost at once in a most spectacular fashion, and a series of integrations, contemplative syntheses took place. Creation through which God spoke, in which he dwelt, concentrated itself into a single beech tree. As befitted the occasion, it was straggly in a sinister way, ugly, not especially significant compared with many of its fellows. But herein, God took his stance. Herein, he disclosed. I, too, experienced a personal integration, a contemplative awareness. The beech tree spoke. What I feared was on its way. Against all the rationalizing, optimistic hopes were no more. There was to be a trauma, a grisly looking turning point. I was not what I wanted, but what I feared. But it was the will of God, so I must learn to want it. Julian of Norwich came to my mind. All manner of things shall be well, but in the end, not yet. It was the will of God, providential, not fatalistic. There was no question of putting up with the inevitable of negative surrender. It was not something that God could make 
doubtless make use of in a roundabout way, but something he demanded positively and purposefully. There was no more to be said, which was the grace, which is the grace bestowed contemplative state. A few weeks later, a near hurricane swept through the valley, but doing surprisingly little damage. I took the same walk, not to recapture the presence because that does not do. That would be Schubert Ogden's semi-idolatry. There was nothing sacred about the beech tree. Once it had been a pinpoint of total creation in which God dwells, a medium for his disclosure, that is all. I crested the hill and the tree was not there, only a gap making visible transcendent uplands beyond. The trees had succumbed to the gale, the tree, excuse me, had succumbed to the gale, uprooted and straddled across the lane. A farmer friend was clearing a way through and cutting it up to burn. He could not understand it, for it was a healthy tree, and it was surrounded by decrepit alms, elms, which are especially susceptible to high winds, shallow-rooted and brittle. Beaches do not readily fall. There were no more casualties within sight. Why? I do not know, and I am not prepared to speculate. One particularly forceful gust, just there. Some geographical trick, whereby the contours created a wind tunnel, just there. But perhaps the tree had fulfilled its purpose a week or so back? Had it remained, perhaps I should have given it too much value, attempting to cheat up another disclosure. Perhaps it was better out of the way. Am I seriously contending that God intervened, intruded, destroying a beech tree for my personal benefit? No, I don't think I am. It's more like Noah's rainbow, just an ordinary rainbow, but nevertheless a specific disclosure at that point. Or who moved the stone? The holy women worried, but they need not have done. I worried. Deep down, I think I was frightened of that tree. I need not have worried. Everything came to pass as I knew it would. Now I am glad. Benedicite omni opera. O ye winds of God, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him forever. So here are some observations I have on this, his spiritual mystical experience. So Father Thornton is, is interpreting theologically an experience that had happened 30 years prior to the publishing of this book. So it's something along the lines of how long it took Julian of Norwich to transcribe her second longer account of her revelations. This itself is an activity of prayer. It's mystagogical prayer, my word, not his, meaning that, meaning he has led and is being led by the Holy Spirit into the mystery of his participation in Christ and by the, at and by the beech tree being led into the mystery of his participation in Christ. Another is that creatures mediate God's presence, his grace and his will, a truly Eucharistic experience of sacrifice and thanksgiving, benedicite. An encounter of God's imminence and transcendence par paradoxically intertwined that demands discernment and competent guidance and direction according to the faith, so that you could actually interpret this. I think that all of Thornton's theology seeks to Getting a bit of noise on this, someone that appears to be not muted. I think all of Thornton's theology seeks to explore this beech tree experience and draw others into the activity of interpreting their own such experiences, whether it's beech tree or the morning coffee or whatever the experience might be when God chooses to reveal himself. So expl by exploring his own experience and learning the, sci the science of doing so and the art of doing so in all of its dimensions or patterns, I think also is a summary of his whole corpus so that he can help others interpret their own such experiences and help priests help their people interpret their own experiences of God. So there are four patterns that emerge in his overall theology. A. The body of Christ is recapitulated in the local community in the parish, the parochial remnant as a whole, and that's the first part of remnant. The parish as a whole is remnant, which is the arena of God's disclosure in locality or in place. That's A. B, the way to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as described by St. Peter in Acts 2.38 is embracing the life described in Acts 2.42. Niggers, nigger, nigger, niggers, niggers. Okay. Is that muted? Um, as described in Acts 2.42, quote, 
And they continue, that's the 3,000 who were baptized, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. For Thornton, that is, means personal devotion. In the breaking of bread, of course, that's the mass. And in the prayers, the offices. In other words, what he calls the threefold regula of mass, office mass, and personal devotion. That's the way to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. C, to teach the clergy to be teachers of prayer. And that was a line from William Temple in a letter he wrote, Temple wrote, that was, that, that was near the beginning of English spirituality and, and also becomes a kind of um, summary of what Thornton was seeking to do in his work was to teach clergy to be teachers of prayer. Hence, Thornton's emphasis on spiritual direction to everyone with a vocation to develop gifts for a life of intercessory vicarious prayer. That is to say, his emphasis on directing the core prayers in one's parish. And that's what he calls the faithful remnant. So you have the parochial remnant, which is everybody, all strata or, or rings of the parish, the geographical parish, including people who, who don't come to church as well as the innermost core is part of the parochial remnant. The faithful remnant refers just to that core of prayers. And the fourth pattern, which is my piece, which is he calls devout experimentation. And so I'll go into very briefly what I'm doing as my devout experimentation with, uh, with Thornton's theology, uh, what I call mystagogical catechesis. Okay, so A, the remnant parish. The, and which is the body of Christ is recapitulated in the local community, in the parish, the parochial remnant as a whole, which is the arena of God's disclosure in place. This is the first of the four patterns. From pastoral theology reorientation, and this is the cover as it was reissued by Cowley. I think it was in 1985. I like the cover. I like how they renamed it, the heart of the parish, the, the theology of the remnant. I don't I don't use that title, but it, it does describe the book Pastoral Theology of Reorientation very well as the heart of the parish. From it comes this passage, the Catholic Church of Dogma. And Thornton, by the way, is unabashed about using Catholic Church to refer to his own and the, and the, the core, you might say, of, of Anglicanism. The Catholic Church of Dogma becomes not only the body of all the faithful people everywhere, but of all faithful parishes or of all faithful people in local society and local environment, local worship and local love. One cannot love a theological formula. One cannot love one's neighbor in the abstract. In fact, one can only love a neighbor, especially since Christian love, rather than mere emotionalism, is a volitional virtue demanding discipline and sacrifice. The Catholic Church is the body, not the sum, of all the faithful, an organic whole comprising parishes as organic wholes comprising souls as organic whole, which is only saying that the vine consists of branches which consist of cells. And the relation between the Catholic and parochial organism is seen to be one of recapitulation or microcosm, ideas constantly recurring in Christian theology, of course, Irenaeus and others. The concept is implied in the doctrine of the Trinity, in Christology, and in atonement. St. Paul addresses the local churches with, ye are the body of Christ. No mere portion of it, still less a group of individuals within it, but the complete body in microcosm. The local church would be regarded by St. Paul not as one element of a Catholic confederacy, but as the local representative of the, wine, the one divine in Catholic society. That's Charles Gore in his epistle to the Ephesians commentary. And if this applies to Ephesus and Corinth, it applies equally to Little Puddlecombe Parish and St. Barnabas Barchester. Another, the church is the body of Christ because it feeds on his Eucharistic body and blood. The consecrated elements are Christ to the communicant, holy and completely Christ. Divide them into 10,000 fragments and each is the body and blood of Christ. So the parish is the Catholic Church in microcosm. That's key. The parish is the Catholic Church in microcosm, and thereby is the remnant. The church, moreover, is threefold. The holy concourse in paradise and in heaven does not split itself into insular parties of patrons per parish. If the whole body is complete at every altar, the whole communion of saints are in attendance at every altar. As Lady Julian saw all creation in a hazelnut, so her hazelnut comes to universal size. When parochialism is organic and when ye are the body of Christ, 
It is the antithesis of narrow, but it is in place, the Catholic Church. Still more from this book. We can truly be said to love our village or town or county or country, even the universe at large, which, is, which by the principle of recapitulation or microcosm becomes much the same thing. God so loved the world, yet the Son of God so loved by a microcosmic love for a few square miles of Palestine. All that concerns us in following him, in being his body in place as a parochial remnant, as his body was, and remained in place, is contemplative harmony with and union with love for that environmental organism we have called a parish in all of its strata. I'm going to move on. So that's the parochial remnant, how the, rent, the parish as a whole is the faithful, is, is the remnant spoke of in the Old Testament and also by Paul. Now, and it is the arena for the, for, for the disclosure of God's presence, and it's the arena of people who are working out how to understand God in their lives, just like Martin tried needed to work out how this beech tree experience worked in his life and a parish in some sense particularly obviously those who attend mass but in some sense everyone because god is active whether anonymously or not in the life of all so that's the parish what happens within the parish and so this is where to sum up his understanding of the activity of the remnant parish it's what he calls the threefold regula and pattern B I described before, the way to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as described by St. Peter in Acts 2.38 is embracing the life described in Acts 2.42. Quote, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, personal devotion, in the breaking of bread, the mass, and in the prayers, the offices. In other words, the threefold regula. Turning to passages from the Purple-Headed Mountain now. Small children obey, to talk about the threefold regula, small children obey their parents necessarily because they have to, even if they cannot understand why they must clean their teeth and tell the truth and not walk all, all over the house in muddy shoes. My children never do any of those things, by the way. And eventually, because of this necessary obedience, they come to see how wise and parents there are. Oh, my, my kids were actually born with that inside already from, from the womb how concerned for their welfare and how valuable all this dis discipline has been. They continue to obey, but now freely and lovingly, they have been literally well brought up. Necessary obedience consists not in vague moral tenets, but in a disciplined acceptance of and cooperation with grace by a systematic use of the sacraments and prayer in loyalty to the church's experience and teaching. For only so armed is it possible to acquire love, virtue, and practical Christian wisdom. In other words, to acquire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as, as Peter taught. William St. Thierry is never content to inspire us with good intentions and pious feelings. He tells us very clearly and very bluntly exactly what we have to do. He does not tell us to say a few prayers and we shall feel better. He says, do this for six months and we shall be better. He does not say, try a little meditation and hope for the best. He says, do this and the church guarantees that it will work. What then is necessary obedience in practice? And here's the threefold regular. The church has never been in any doubt about the basic pattern of Christian life that rests on three fundamental and inter interrelated things. This is the regular. The Holy Eucharist, our ordinary means of grace and center of all Christian life, the channel of redemption for ourselves and all creation. The church is one formal office, the continuous praise of God by and through the body of Christ, and our share in the eternal adoration of heaven, and our own unique personal devotion according to our personal gifts, particular gifts and temperament. And there's nothing arbitrary or artificial about this, for it clearly comes from the New Testament. The Eucharist instituted at the Last Supper. That's the Mass, obviously. All kinds of personal devotion by people as different as Zacchaeus and St. Peter, as Martha and Mary, and the, that's uh, personal devotion. And the Lord's Prayer, the first set prayer or office by the whole church. It's interesting that he sees the office coming and deriving from, from the Lord's Prayer, because it's a set prayer. And it has developed ever since, especially, of course, by St. Basil, St. Benedict, later by, later by the Friars Minor, and in a very special way, by the Anglican Church. 
And although it has developed according to needs and circumstances, the basic pattern is unchanged and unchangeable. I have always been surprised, Thornton concludes in this passage, that this practical living pattern, regula, of prayer is so seldom seen as a test for the orthodoxy of a particular communion of the church. That a church is truly Catholic and apostolic is argued with reference to its creeds, its ministry, its use of the Bible, its sacraments, and so on, all of which, of course, are of great importance. But the daily use of the universal three, threefold pattern regular seems to me to be a test of equal significance. It is especially important to see this rule as one integrated thing, one basis for the truly spiritual or completely human life. We are not dealing with three separate or separable things, but with a unity. So the high churchman who stresses the Eucharist and belittles the office, the low churchman who likes matins and evensong at the expense of the Eucharist, and the free churchman who emphasizes personal devotion against formal corporate worship set prayers are all making the same basic error. They are all too concerned with services and not concerned enough with total Christian life based on the church's rule. Now I want to finish a passage that came earlier from the remnant sec from the parochial remnant section. As Lady Julian saw all creation in a hazelnut, so her hazelnut comes to universal size. When parochialism is, in, is organic and when ye are the body of Christ, it is the antithesis of narrow, but it is in place the Catholic Church. There is, one, there is but one bread, so each altar is microcosmic of the throne of the Lamb in heaven. There is one church and one body, so that the work of each server, each organist, each verger, each good lady who arranged the flowers is of Catholic significance because it is truly parochial. That is why the church's office, said by two souls in the village church on Monday night, is an infinitely tremendous thing. The special service with its teeming congregation, I think he's referring here to Coral Evensong, is trivial by comparison. Not trivial in general, but trivial by comparison. I suggest that our greatest hope lies, this comes from Feed My Lambs, in the overthrow of that departmentalism which has invaded liturgical thought as well as most other branches of divinity. Amen to that. May we look at the prayer book not so much as a legal code of liturgical behavior or as, or as the enactment of a certain English parliament, still less as a series of isolable services for various occasions, but as the ascetical framework of a particular school of Christian spirituality. May we look at the, as the, to the prayer book for an integrated scheme of Christian living before we bother too much with the minutia of its particular rites? What this means in practice is that the first degree of loyalty insists that the Holy Eucharist is celebrated on those days when the prayer book provides for it, and the office is said daily by priest and laity, never mind how few, that's the faithful remnant, and that all should make some attempt at private prayer, which he later calls personal devotion. In other words, Eucharist office and personal devotion is the stuff of the parochial remnant or of the parish. But the parochial remnant and, and threefold regula is done by people. And so here we move now to, you might say, the prayers of the parish, that is to say, the core, as it were. And this isn't to introduce layers of elitism or, you know, people first in the salvation line or anything like that. It's simply to say people who have a vocation to a life of daily prayer. That's the faithful remnant. And so the, the, the pattern C again to teach the clergy to be teachers of prayer from William Temple's letter. Hence Thornton's emphasis on spiritual direction to everyone, not everyone in the parish, but to everyone with a vocation to develop gifts for a life of intercessory vicarious prayer, the faithful remnant. From Christian proficiency comes this passage. This is a passage well known to many, many clergy in the Episcopal Church. Uh, the state of soul described by as habitually recollected is the highest degree of proficiency to which we can normally hope to attain in whatever our prayer technique and rule are regular. It is well to have our eyes fixed clearly on the target. This is the state, habitual recollection, of permanent God-centeredness where the presence of God is known, felt, or realized continuously 
and without major interruption. This knowledge or experience may be subconscious in the ordinary practical life of busy people. It will often have to be. But it is nevertheless very real and will cover the whole of life. The recollected character is one who manifests a faith that sees God as the true end of all things, whether large or small, sorrowful or joyous, grim or gay. And yes, that's the older definition. And he is known to his friends as someone who is balanced, level-headed, or reliable, one who makes a success of life because he has things in perspective. In fact, habitual recollection implies a love of, for God analogous to a man's love for his wife. He will actually think of her fairly frequently, but mostly he will get on with his work efficiently and joyfully for her sake, you know, vicariously. Subconsciously, he never leaves her. But this does not make him inefficient at work like the lovesick youth who cannot concentrate on anything but the object of his affection. Rather, this love is itself the really constant thing which inspires rather than hinders everyday work. It gives everything an object and a purpose. It, this is one place where the doctrine of the church as the bride of Christ will help us so long as we think sensibly in terms of efficient housework as well as devotion. Now, what his primary, or you might say, high, uh, uh, all-star example of the faithful remnant of all figures that he could choose from is Marjorie Kemp. Here is something from his commentary, chapter three. Marjorie made progress like most of us, not by climbing some spiritual ladder, not by turning meditative prayer into contemplative prayer, or by proceeding from discursive thought to an effective state, sorry for the voice there, but by making the same sort of prayers better and better year after year, and by manifesting her growth, not in heightened experience, but in works of charity and love for creation. She was to some extent familiar with the works of St. Bonaventure, and doubtless learnt more from her Franciscan, Franciscan friends and her priests, but she would not have understood the three ways and as, as an ascetical hierarchy, she lived in all the ways all the time. Like a significant minority of modern English Christians, she occasionally reached a real union with our Lord. Like all of us, she was never rid of temptation and occasional serious falls. She listened to sermons whenever the opportunity arose and continued loyally to take part in the church's corporate vocal prayer in the lay office of Our Lady, and she lived naturally and spontaneously to the church's calendar. Arguments about when or whether vocal prayer can be replaced by meditation or at what stage formal offices may be abandoned by lay people would have left her such just as bewildered as they do me. The idea of contemplative status could be a substitute for ordinary duties of practical life and churchmanship. That's what, I'm ta that's what I talk, call parishionership ordinary duties of practical spiritual life and churchmanship, or that one type of devotion was higher than another, would never have entered her head. Now you all are getting a little bit of a uh, first crack into something that very few people have, have read. And this is from an unpublished essay written near the end of his life. Uh, Father Thornton wrote this. The function of a parish intercessor, now here he doesn't mean the person who is assigned to read the prayers of the people or the intercessions at Sunday Mass. He's referring to the faithful remnant soul. He's referring, referring to a person who has a vocation uh, for prayer, uh, the faithful remnant. The function of a parish intercessor is expressed in a life of vicarious prayer under competent guidance and in association with her parish priest. In addition, history suggests that she, and he, he does mean she here because he thinks it's usually a woman, may well prove to be herself a guide and inspiration to others. By virtue of her vocation, she is likely to know a great deal of ascetical theology. Detailed rule or regula will vary with circumstances and a trait, but the sort of evisist is something akin to oblation of a, to a religious community. This, that is to say, the intercessor has something like an oblation to a religious community. Eucharistic worship several times a week, the daily office, the divine office, excuse me, daily, and about one hour personal prayer daily. She will invariably be a penitent. So these are, you might say, characteristics or a kind of template, maybe perhaps, of 
what the faithful remnant, that is to say, the people who really desire an active and uh, desire to have a fire, to be on fire for Christ, um, perhaps might become with, under guidance of the parish priest. I'll, I'll read this last, par this last uh, uh, because it finishes up uh, pattern C, and this comes from spiritual direction. Spiritual direction is, in, is concerned with religion and intrinsically with nothing else. Religion is expressed in prayer, which is the ongoing relationship between men and women with God in Christ, involuntarily given in baptism. Such prayer has to be worked out in the world. Current cultural patterns are part of it, and ultimately it leads to practical wisdom, practical action, and service towards society at large, but only ultimately, and only if we stick to our religious guns and refuse to take the rest too seriously. Spiritual direction assumes the centrality of prayer as power to act. It expresses the religious dimension rather than diminishing cultural addendum to which the respectable people nod assent without really believing in it. The practical outgoing Christian is not someone who, vaguely inspired by Jesus, sets, off about, sets about solving the world's problems and trying to love his neighbor off his own bat. I think this is a cricket reference, albeit autographed by Jesus. Rather, he is one who, ontologically incorporated into the sacred humanity of Christ, becomes his redemptive instrument. Nor for the first time Aquinas got it right. Prayer is, quote, loving God in act so that the divine life can communicate itself to us and through us to the world. That the divine life can communicate itself to us and through us to the world. Again, we're back to the beet tree experience for Thornton. That's exactly what he uh, tried to do. Christian action is not action of which Jesus approves. I guess that's his little criticism of what would Jesus do? But action that he performs through his incorporated and therefore prayerful disciples. If Christianity is anything, it is to regain any, if it is to regain any earthly influence, it must boldly proclaim itself as religion. Or in, you know, to, in Paul's term, we are to be ambassadors of Christ, him working through us. Okay. The last piece here is, uh, and I'll go through this relatively quickly, devout experimentation. What did Thornton mean by that? Because that's what I'm doing. Um, so before I, just, before I say what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about what he meant by devout experimentation. It, it's important. From the Rock in the River. In an attempt to synthesize Catholic truth with contemporary thought, George Tyrell is said to have made reluctant concessions to modernity. But the, the ascetical approach is not modernism. It is not concerned with concessions at all. It seeks only to such new thought about God and creation that lends itself to devout experiment in prayer. In other words, rooted in orthodoxy. It looks to both modern and ancient thought in a spirit of adventure, accepting the former when it proves to be creative and rejecting the latter only when it, cl it clearly ceases to be. The ascetical approach starts from the rock and proceeds to the river as it manifests a response to grace in the circumstances and environment of today, but it has no interest in being in, in the merely fashionable. The modern mistake is, is the failure to recognize that the reinterpretation of the gospel to every age is itself an integral part of orthodoxy with its own proper approach, method, and discipline. This interpretive aspect of Christian orthodoxy is ascetical or sometimes spiritual theology. It is the practical and pastoral approach to Christian truth, which guides action through stressing the living, present, and concrete, or if you like, existential, or I would add, mystagogical relationship between God and man in prayer, together with the moral disciplines which nurture and support it. Ascetical theology is the church's own built-in apparatus for taking intellectual and cultural change seriously and intelligently. So what is my devout experiment? And I've been doing this for several years now in my parish, and I've also been asked to lead Lenten retreats on this. It's, this is the experiment, mystagogical use of the upper room as described in Acts chapter one, as well as in John and in other places. Mystagogical use of the upper room to in, induce growth in the Holy Spirit and in the sensed presence of Jesus Christ, along with catechesis in the ascetical moral life. So I'm saying I'm using the icon with my parishioners and with people, guiding them 
praying the icon with them, this icon that you see on the right, which I'll talk a bit about, to induce growth in myself as well as all, everyone else in the Holy Spirit and to induce growth in, his, in the sensed presence of Jesus Christ and along the way to induce catechesis in the ascetical and moral life by inhabiting the upper room, by, by um, composing the composition of place in the upper room, to use an Ignatian term. Okay, I'm going to skip this. What got me going on this was something from Thornton from a, a late book, Prayer, A New Encounter. He wrote, characteristic of the spirituality of the New Testament and of the church's first centuries was an uninhibited spontaneity. In spite of poverty and persecution, there was a childlike joy, even a gaiety about it. No need to search for God in his prevenient, excuse me, no need to search for God for his prevenient presence was the plainest of facts. I must have thought about this passage for years, like not, not in terms of questioning it, but wanting to be feeling uninhabited spontaneity and that the prevenient, prevenient presence of God was the plainest of facts. It's something I, I accepted intellectually, right? But I wanted to feel it. I wanted my heart to be on fire. And then, Providentially, Ephraim, of, Ephraim the Syrian found me, and one of his verses, Blessed are you, O upper room, so small in comparison to the entirety of creation, yet what took place in you now fills all creation, for which, which is even too small for it. Blessed is your abode, for in it was broken that bread which ish issues from the blessed wheat sheaf, and in you was trodden out the cluster of grapes that came from Mary to become the cup of salvation. In the upper room was the bread, and in the upper room was trodden the cluster of grapes. And in the upper room was something so small in comparison to the entirety of creation, yet what took place now fills all creation. It's a stunning thought. Or as I have said, the upper room is, is like a womb where the, the church finished, finished its gestation period. And so over the nine days in the upper room, um, where the 120 members of the upper room parish church met uh, being apostles all 120 of them because they were sent apostolically by jesus as uh, as he was ascending they spent the, the time in the upper room and it became a womb for the church and so at pentecost nine or ten days later the womb of the upper room went boom To finish, praying this icon I have found in my devout experimentation, and of course it's, an, it's experimental and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all in the doing. I found, however, that it is a potent means for opening the scriptures of Acts 1 and 2. Its context, the upper room, inhabiting it, induces a mystagogy whereby we can enter into the upper room through inquiries such as, open-ended inquiries such as, or what Marshall McLuhan might call probes, who was in the room? What experiences and desires did they bring with them in the upper room? And we know some of the people who were there, Mary and the, and the 11 and other holy women, so probably Mary Magdalene and Martha and Mary, the wife of Clopas, was there probably, and perhaps Mar uh, Peter's mother-in-law and uh, other holy women who went to the tomb. What did they do over the nine days is a particularly mystagogical question. And, and perhaps at the heart of it all was, how was Jesus Christ present? And if you can see this icon, and by the way, the icon is by the hand of Aidan Hart that was commissioned by the St. John's Bible. If you can see the top, you can see Jesus. And this is represented symbolically as um, both ascended, of course, and resurrected. He, he has a book open, and the book simply says, I am. 
echoing all of the I am statements in John's gospel, I am statements that are also littered throughout Isaiah and elsewhere in scripture. And so how was Jesus present? How was his I amness present? It's, this has been a, and, and I have experimented with this as a way also to induce people to want to pray the daily offices rather than it be a duty, but seeing the grace of it because through the daily offices, we are able to enjoy the daily bread and savor and inwardly digest the, the daily bread um, that undoubtedly the upper room was. And other topics that have come up have been the Sermon of Spirits, uh, Mary's motherhood of the church, the mother of the church, threefold regular communion of saints, divine providence, and more. Okay, I'm going to sum up now. The parish prayer life, the parochial theology of Martin Thornton, in sum, a true and total life of prayer where prayer is the ultimate priority and is intercessory for the world and vicarious on behalf of the world and is caught up in the communion and fellowship of the saints, their witness and voices in the threefold church, both in the English tradition, broadly construed and beyond the English tradition, and is rooted in guiding, reforming, and transforming souls into the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, that is, better prayer, and by means of the Book of Common Prayer as a setical system, along with competent spiritual guidance by the parish priest or somebody else. Okay. I have to read this poem. I know a bit over time, but I, I think I have to. So here it is. This is a, a poem he wrote for The Countryman, which is a publication I believe still in existence, summer 1972. This is what it looked like in, uh, in print form. He did not do the illustration. Someone named Arnold Wiles did. Ode to Millicent or Franciscus Redivivus. I think it's the only poem he wrote. I was digging up potatoes in the garden of the rectory in cold October sunshine, working steadily along, neither burdened by the labor nor the time that it would take me, all enveloped in potatoes, millipedes, another row. I was digging up potatoes in the garden of the rectory, forget me not, convolvulus, more millipedes, and dock. I was digging up the potatoes when I stopped and lit my pipe. So I meandered, daydreamed, convolvulus and smoke rings, bird songs, thistle down, millipedes and daisies, men and ladies, boys and girls, convolvulus and babies. I was digging up potatoes when I stopped. The God said, stop. And millipedes stopped. And God said, Benedicite, I wish to intrude, introduce Miss Millicent Peed. And I said, good afternoon, Miss Peed. And she said, shall I sing a song to you? And I said, yes, please. So she sang. The Trinity may be with infinite care, with other such creatures his friendship to share. For he's fond of me, loving me all of my life. And he also made rabbits and maggots and mice and bears and black beetles and lizards and lice. It's marvelous too, that he also produces donkeys and ducks and remarkable gooses and Einstein and Schweitzer and Leibniz and Payne and Martha and Mary and Emily Jane. Yet the infinite glory I'm sure you'll concede is that God is so fond of Miss Millicent Peed. Then I dug some more potatoes in the garden of the rectory in cold October sunshine, working steadily along. I felt elevated, edified, incomparably comforted, excited, thrilled, and sanctified by Sister Millie's song. I have dug up lots of learning in the lecture room and library, in dull December darkness, reading rapidly along. I have read about the attributes ascribed to the divinity by Paul and Mark and Matthew, Thomas and Tertullian. I must hasten to refresh my mind by Bellarmine or Bede, but the God whom I can worship is the one who loves Miss Pede.
Thank you all. That concludes my presentation. Robert, thank you very much indeed for what you have given us this evening. For those of us who uh, don't know much about Martin Thornton, you have given us more than an introduction into his life and his works, his theology, his understanding, and the way in which he connects the experience uh, along with his learning. Uh, your, your depth of knowledge is evident. Uh, your passion and enthusiasm for the speaker, uh, uh, for, the, for the topic, is, uh, is more, than, more than apparent to us. And uh, I know that uh, we're, we're ending our day here, but you are in the middle of yours. So thank you very much for giving up your time, uh, around lunchtime particularly, uh, to come and speak to us this evening. Uh, it's been much appreciated. Thank you very much indeed on behalf of us all. My honour and pleasure, Father. <laughs> I hand over to uh, Father Matthew, who I think is going to compare the questions for you. Uh, so ask your questions to Father Matthew via Father Matthew. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Father. That was absolutely phenomenal. The, the imagery was amazing. And um, I don't know quite where you live, but now I know that you've got one of those books. I'm sure it'll be worth the flight over. <laughs> so questions wise... <laughs> Um, if you could just raise your hand in real life um, so that I can see your, your raised hand. And then I'll ask Father Chris to unmute you because I can't because he's the admin. Well, I'll, I'll kick off then whilst we all, we all think and let that, that quietly wash over. F Father Matthew, it's, it's such a... He's such an interesting figure and not somebody that you would accidentally come across. How, how did you first come across him? Accidentally. I, it was nine years ago, almost. I say that because it was my 30, oh, 37th birthday, 36th birthday, something like that. And my wife asked me, where, where do you like to go for your birthday? And my kids demanded ice cream. And so I said, okay, we'll go to ice cream, but then let's go to this used bookstore. Uh, we were living in Chicago at the time where we lived for 13 years. I love Chicago. And um, we went to the bookstore. It's called Half Price Books in Niles, which is near O'Hare Airport. And in the shelves, in the theology section, his book, English Spirituality, found me. And no one told me to read it, never heard of him before. I would have, uh, I would have in, in my seminary studies quickly heard of him, um, but I hadn't yet. And so it was nine years ago that uh, he found me and, or I should say, God made him find me. And I, uh, man, I, I, I dive deeply uh, right away. My rector called me a Thornton junkie. Um, my seminary uh, professors and um, some friends just made fun of me for always talking about Martin Thornton. My bishop does a bit. So, yeah, you know, uh, I read all of his books within nine months and just haven't stopped. That was nine years ago. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Father Darren? Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Father Dahlman, for that, uh, for that talk. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, through Father Dahlman, I discovered Thornton and, and have been um, working on, uh, on that uh, with him. Um, one of the things that really has captured me is the, that idea of the remnant uh, and remnant theology. And I wonder if you know something of, of kind of how Thornton came about that. Is that his own... Um, uh, his own idea that he developed uh, did he um, uh, come to it in conversation with with those many theologians that we see him in conversation with in his in his books um, where where did that where did that come from and and how did you see that develop well of course remnant is all over the, the scriptures um, the prophets particularly and he uh, cites uh, Isaiah as probably the fullest expression of the remnant. Um, in terms of 
uh, interpreting it according to the cross and by the light of the cross. He starts doing it in his very first book. He does not provide any citation as to someone's thought that he's bouncing off of. You can find a great deal of remnant theology within Christian circles and, and in all of our various traditions of the church, both sacramental and, uh, and uh, Protestant, so to speak. Um, I think he just was taken up through it through his scripture studies at King's College in London. Um, which is where, where, where he was when he started writing his first book that talked about the remnants among other topics. I think he was struck by it, and perhaps he was instructed by uh, Eric Abbott Symes or uh, Hubert Relton or uh, Edward Radcliffe or some of his other professors in it. I think you can, you can certainly find um, literature on the, the faithful remnant uh, in Christian literature, um, but Thornton, even when he became, uh, in most of his books, he has citations and, and uh, in enormous bibliographies. Um, he never really cites anyone talking about the, the remnant. So I, I do think that his treatment, treatment of, it, of it is fairly original. And mm -hmm. seeing it in its two ways, one is the whole parish, in not, you know, in the, everyone in the geographical parish, and then as, as like the outmost ring, you might say, people who come to church or not, and then occasional or semi-regular visitors to mass would be like the, the middle ring, which is a lot of people. Um, and then the inmost ring would be those who have a vocation to prayer, and that's what he calls the faithful remnant. Um, yeah, I think this is, I think he's very original on this. And I, I think it's one of the reasons why uh, pastoral theology had such a splash. Marty, Martin Marty, the Lutheran a commentator on all things American church in the 20th century, immediately swapped up this book and, and started talking about it. Um, uh, so, and that's a big deal because Thornton was not a famous author at that point. And to, he was being paid attention to by Martin Marty, which is a big deal. And it's because of this remnant thing. I think it was, he was so original and so creative and pastoral about it. Um, so it's not, and I just want to be, be very, very clear and, and speak on behalf of Father Thornton. It's not a soteriological concept, which is the mistake many people make. And, you know, the whole left behind thing, you know, it's not that the faithful remnant is about to be swooped up. It's that God's saving action is happening in and through them. It's not the saved remnant, he wrote once, but the saving remnant as a vicarious uh, ministry on behalf of all. Not everyone is, is called to it. So it's not a soteriological concept. It's a vocational one. And not everyone is called to it. Is, and, and that's just fine. But all people participate in the fruits of the faithful remnant, because these are the people who are praying the daily offices and are uh, um, always at Mass and are living a life of Christian devotion, whether they're reading the Bible or whether they're going to the post office. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Um, Charlotte has raised her hand digitally, so we'll go to Charlotte next. And then, James, I saw your wave, so we'll come to you after Charlotte. Um, thank you, Father Matthew, for that uh, fascinating talk. When you uh, mentioned um, that Martin Thornton used to be much more widely read than he is now, and having read three of his books now, they're, they're fabulous, and he deserves to be better known. I suppose my question is, if he was known when uh, he was writing, but has had since sort of fallen out of favor or has not been read recently. Why? What happened? Oh, good question. Um, so he's, he was, even in his life, he was always more widely read in the United States and Canada, North America, than in the UK, in his life. And he, he sort of bemoaned that 
although, I mean, there's a long tradition of that kind of thing, um, including in the scriptures, of course, describing Jesus. Um, and so you would have to separate out the contexts, okay? Because he still is pretty well read in the United States in seminaries, um, in theological schools, not just in the Shota House, where he'll never go off the curriculum there, but in many of the other Episcopal seminaries, as well as the, uh, uh, the non-Episcopal Anglican schools of theology. He's read there too. The ACNA, I mean, those, the, there's no question that in the United States, Thornton remains among people trained for either uh, lay, catechist, lay catechist or holy orders, uh, he is read. In the UK is a totally different story. And he certainly was read. I mean, I talked about the endorsements from the likes of uh, George Leonard and, no, that's not, Graham Leonard, excuse me, uh, John McQuarrie, Arthur Michael Ramsey. There, there's a longer list on that, Eric Maskell. But um, why? You know, I, I don't want to over, over speculate. I don't know the UK context all that well. I know that, that, the, that the UK has been a crucible for all sorts of stuff going on since World War II in terms of Christian traditions and Christian styles. Um, I would say evangelical, this, and this is a non-judgmental statement whatsoever, but I would say that a lot of at least older evangelical movements in the UK probably wouldn't find a lot here in Thornton, or at least not immediately. Anyone who's fighting a cultural war on whatever side will not be able to use Thornton's work at all as ammo. He's simply too peaceful and he's, he's too calibrated and refined and sober to be used and, and on any hot button issue. And, and really, um, so, you know, that eliminates a lot of people. Um, and also the third thing I would say is that within the UK academic uh, climate over the last several, three, four decades, and Rowan William confirmed this, but so did Alison Milbank, who I met with, John Milbank, who I interacted about this, George Westhaver at Pusey House, and Benedict Toward. You know, a, a lot of theologians aren't canonical at any given time for the academia. And Thornton has never been uh, canonical for the last 50 years amongst academics. I would say the last very, very serious Anglican academic who, who, who knew everything about for whom Thornton was canonical would have been someone like Eric Maskell and John Macquarie. So that's not la that long ago because Macquarie died in 2007. But nonetheless, I think other movements have taken over other interests and other sources. And I think this is, I, I'm, I'm convinced this is providential. I really am. Thornton certainly would encourage us to, to consider that possibility, that his, the time wasn't quite right. And I'm convinced that at least in the American context, but I, I think in the UK context too, and I have very, a number of, of contexts, that Thornton does appeal um, in, in the UK context. So anyway, it's up to God and, and people finding him on their own, which is a beautiful thing. Thank you, Father. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, for that question. James, we'll come to you now. And um, if anybody has a really burning question, so Father Gary, we'll come to you after James. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's very soft. It's very soft. It's, it's too quiet. Is this better? Yes. OK. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you for what you've said. Uh, when I was a parish priest, I, I'm a Canadian Armed Forces military chaplain now, um, in, obviously in Canada. Um, when I was a parish priest, I picked up in a used bookstore, English Spirituality, which I ended up using as a study group in the parish, um, and, uh, used, uh, um, a reorientation of 
the, the Regula for a, a retreat, a, a London choir, quiet day. Loved Thornton uh, and, and do love him because he, he just made so much sense to me. But at the same time, I, I could never get quite inspired by him. Um, and part of me uh, joining today was to see if maybe that would change. And, and you're uh, talk, uh, talking about the beech tree um, seemed to, you know, it, it was just a sort of a bomb on me. That was just wonderful. I'm wondering if there are other uh, places in in Thornton's writing or his own religious experience, we might, might say, is so well is in the is in the same manner as as it is in his story of the beach tree. Are you asking if there's equivalent experiences in his writing that he describes equivalent to the beech tree? I am, yeah. Okay. Um, well, nothing as, at quite length. Um, and, I, and before I answer that directly, I, I, I will say there's a very good reason why I, I led, so to speak, in, as we dive deeply it, with the beech tree because I think with much Anglican theology, even the best stuff, it, there, it, it, and, and his stuff is very well written and it's sober and he's funny at times, and particularly if you know that he has a dry sense of humor. But it's, it can, you know, it's still got that Anglican um, cerebral thing, you know, uh, and it's a cerebral thing. So, I mean, it's just, there's in some ways there's no escaping that kind of thing, I suppose, in the theological endeavor. Um, so I led with that to try to bring him alive, and, I, and I'm glad that you're saying, James, that it did so. Um, well, he talked about, in, in the book Prayer, A New Encounter, he didn't talk about the beech tree, but he talked about a cherry tree, and it's the same thing, and so he, he uses the image of a cherry tree as kind of an icon in that book of understanding mystagogical experience or uh, mystical experience um, with everyday things. Um, he never described the birth of his wife and his daughter Magdalene, who I, who I should add, by the way, uh, many of you may know her. Her, her married name is, is Magdalene Smith. She's married, uh, she's ordained, she's a priest. She's married to Paul Smith. Magdalene, apparently now, she used to live in um, Wilmslow near Chester is now doing work for Church House in Westminster on the national vocations team. And she's a published author from, I think, two books on SPCK. Magdalene Smith is their daughter. And she's married to Paul Smith, who's the canon at Guildford Cathedral. Um, so if any of you uh, know that, I'm sure many of you do. I just meant know them through those uh, means. He did, he was incredibly moved, as many of us are, by the birth of their child. And there is an unpublished, you're getting all sorts of uh, um, bombs here. There is an unpublished book that I will publish, but no time soon. And it is, a, it is an allegory about the birth of their child, Magdalene, and, the, and how it was a bombshell in their life. And if, if, uh, as long as all of you promise not to in response to what I just say, in any way think that Martin Thornton was heterodox or heretical, I'm asking you to promise. The book is an allegory about the second coming of Christ as a woman. And it's clearly allegorical with the birth of their daughter. And it is a beautifully told and incredibly interesting uh, novel. It's a novel, it's fictitious about the second coming of Christ as a woman. And all of Thornton's topics get into it. In All of his theological emphases are in it, but from a very, very different perspective. It's, it's set in Georgia in the United States, um, Atlanta diocese, where he was very fond and visited several times. And he's a, he's a parish priest in Atlanta um, when Christ visits as a woman. So anyway, it's not that wacky, just the, the lead of it is. But no, James, actually not, not a whole lot. Just not a whole lot other than those examples. 
Thank you, Father. We'll take one last question then from Father Gary and we will wrap things up. Oh, uh, before Gary, you start, I see a question in the chat room from Nigel. Surely Miss Pete is very similar to the beech tree. Yes, thank you. You're absolutely correct. Absolutely. The, the, the Millicent uh, Pete is right on. I just wanted to comment really on how incredibly prophetic his writing seems to be in our contemporary context, and certainly listening with English Anglican ears in the context of uh, um, where we're at in terms of uh, how knowledgeable our laity are about the faith, for instance. You know, his, his call for a, revivi a revivified spirituality is incredibly significant, I think, in terms of how we approach uh, uh, the growth of the church but also you know, the future of uh, a parish reorganization, church planting and all that sort of agenda. When he says in The Rock and the River, for instance, and I quote, any attempt at scrapping everything and starting again is impossibly naive and unrealistic. I'd love the bishops and archdeacons of the Church of England to read some of this stuff because it gives a very different, I think, corrective to the prevailing uh, approach to the life and work of the church. Thank you, Father Gary, for that uh, comment and observation. Uh, and I think the same applies it, over here. Um, there are bishops who have read Martin Thornton. You know, there, there haven't been, and I, th this is gonna sound all sorts of puffed up, but I mean, there just haven't been, there hasn't been anyone like me uh, to, to take on his or her shoulders the task of, of getting his advocacy out there. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, I find that his work, and this is a nice way to stop, is in, you, you mentioned that it's a nice corrective. I think that that's a quality of his writing on all levels, on all topics, is that he's pre what he's presenting us for our consideration is not what he expects anyone to slavishly imitate robotically as if he has everything figured out and all you have to do is implement his genius plan. No, it's, it's that he brings a thoughtfulness, a refinement rooted in his study of English tradition and theology in general, is a refinement of sensibility that perhaps he got from his parents, I mean, who knows, as a, to, to, to give us a theological outlook that at least is a good place to start or you know, to have a working point of departure, a model, whether it be spiritual direction, whether it be the understanding of Anglicanism, whether it be the role of the Book of Common Prayer in our life, um, whether it uh, Christian doctrine, uh, scripture, um, right on down the line, the saints, um, wonder and mystery. I mean, he's, he has tried and endeavored, and I think he was very successful to present not simply at all a nice, fanciful account of the church that might have been or was in the, in the common room, but rather and that's why I emphasized resourcement, the going back and finding the living tradition through primary sources and through original thinking upon the primary sources, resourcement as a means of going, of, of assessing the present to go forward. And, and you know, if, if in reading Martin Thornton, a parish priest, for example, is inspired to try an initiative to stir up interest in the parish, in the daily office, Thornton would applaud and say amen and say, here's a couple of things I've thought about. Now go at it, experiment devoutly. Or whether it's, that's, I'll just leave that example, anything. He's provided points of departure, always, always, prevent, always presented in a very balanced uh, way that he would call a Benedictine way. Um, and, it's a treasure, and I and I hope that that people see it that way, not as 
the way that it used to be or the way that it was before the church got all heterodox or anything like that, but rather even more so the way that we, the aim from a teleological perspective of what we can shoot for and start to work on hands in the dirt in our parishes. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Father Matthew, for opening up such a interesting and new area of study for many of us. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Father Sam, who's going to tell us a little bit about next week's lecture, which is on somebody that, I mean, we've all heard of Martin Thornton, but I don't think any of us really have heard of the next person that we'll be talking about. <laughs> Thank you. So the next, uh, the next Towers of Faith seminar is on Wednesday the 27th of May at 7 p.m. And uh, the caption for this, uh, this individual is challenging child, avid thinker, monastic leader, bishop, father of Western theology and person of prayer. Uh, we'll be looking at St. Augustine of Hippo uh, and the title is An Invitation to Prayer. And I shall leave it there for our, for our speaker next time to tell you some more. Our speaker is Kirsty Borthwick, who's currently an ordinand in the Church of England studying at Westcott House and finishing her PhD on the doctrine of prayer in conversation with Augustine's Trinitarian theology. So please do join us for that at seven o'clock on Wednesday the 27th of May. And finally, once again, thank you very much, Father, for joining us this evening and presenting your lecture to us. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all so much. Good night, everybody. See you next week.